uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming to the East Asia Center Lecture Series on a beauti beautiful Friday afternoon. Uh, but it also gives me great pleasure to introduce a senior colleague in my field, uh, an art historian of Chinese art. Uh, professor Julia Murray, uh, she recently retired, so she is Professor Emerita of, of Art History, East Asian Studies and Religious Studies at the University of Wisconsin. She's also an associate in research at the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies at Harvard University. Uh, currently, she lives in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. Before entering acad uh, the academic world, she worked in curatorial positions at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The, can you speak up? Oh, maybe I'll borrow her. <laughs> turn it on. Okay, all right. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, before uh, getting back to university to teach, uh, Julia had been curator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Freer Gallery of Art, and also the Harvard University Art Museums. She has taught courses on many aspects of the history of Chinese art in a variety of media from Neolithic times to the present, with particular emphasis on late imperial pictorial art. Although when I first got to know Julia, I knew she was an expert on early Chinese jades. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Her numerous research fellowships is really impressive. Um, include awards from the Guggenheim Foundation, Ameri the American Council of Learned Societies, the National Endowment for the Humanities, Zhang Jingguo Foundation, Asian C C uh, C Cultural Council, and also the Metropolitan Center for Research uh, on Far Eastern Art. Her current research focuses on the visual and material culture associated with the veneration of Confucius, which is also the subject of her talk today. Um, her publications uh, include Mirror of Morality, Chinese Narrative Illustrations and Confucius Ideology in 2000. Seven. Uh, just last year, it came out uh, with a Chinese edition, published in Beijing, is that correct? Yeah. All right. Other books include uh, Mahozi and the Illustration of the Book of Olds, Last of the Mandarins, and A Decade of Discovery, as well as numerous articles. In 2010, she served as the guest curator and catalog co-author uh, for the exhibition, Confucius, His Life and Legacy in the Art, at, uh, which was held at the China Institute Gallery in New York. Uh, the exhibition was also but was organized by the Institute and also with the Shandong Provincial Museum. And as we know, Shandong is the hometown of Confucius, so how appropriate was that? And today she's going to talk about um, the contemporary images of Confucius in China. Thank you very much. And I'm going to dim the lights a bit. Not too dark. Don't want you to fall asleep. It has happened. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wong, for that gracious introduction, and also thank you to the Center for East Asia here at the University of Virginia. What probably few of you may know is I am actually a native of Virginia, and I grew up knowing of this place as the university. <laughs> and in fact, my very first public lecture was at Woodbury Forest School, just a few miles away from here. And that was in 1975, in connection with an exhibition of Chinese archaeological treasures that were sent to various museums around uh, America and Europe. So this is a really kind of a resonant occasion for me. So I'm uh, delighted to see so many people have turned out on this beautiful Friday afternoon. And 
Also, I remember back in the day, uh, Friday afternoons, you wouldn't expect to see anybody in class, so anyhow, thank you for coming. Now, back in the early 1990s, when I started working on images of Confucius, I typically got one of two reactions from people in either art history or other areas of East Asian studies. One was, oh, there are images of Confucius, you know, something to study, or how boring. <laughs> And um, I also found there was really very little scholarly literature to look at on the subject of images of Confucius. So I felt like I discovered or stumbled across something that had a lot of potential, but it would be hard to get people interested in it. But now, how times have changed. He seems to be all over the place, as this New Yorker cartoon uh, published last year widely suggests. And I, I highly recommend the article that it accompanied. It was by Evan Osnos, who's um, written a great book called uh, China, the Age of Ambition. And this was sort of a preview of that book. But in any case, this cartoon was published with his article. And if you look uh, closely at the picture, you see there's a picture of Confucius on just about every little object in that uh, scene. Uh, the Chinese government, or we might say the party state, the Communist Party does control the government of China. Uh, has been using Confucius in various ways, both at home and abroad, to represent Chinese civilization and to protect its uh, interests around the world. And there are a number of initiatives that appropriate the name or idea of Confucius uh, that have come to uh, be used in recent years. And probably the best known of them is Confucius Institutes. And the Chinese say, oh, that's like the Goethe Institute or the Alliance Francaise. Um, and they've been established as partnerships between Chinese and US universities with money from the Chinese Ministry of Education to teach Chinese language and culture, but only according to a certain prescribed uh, point of view. And uh, there have been some controversies uh, recently because uh, they may infringe in some respects on academic freedom, on uh, the university's control over hiring, and uh, things like you know, the position that is taken on China, uh, Tibet, and Taiwan's relationship to the rest of China, or even the Falun Gong, the uh, religious and health-based movement that has been uh, outlawed and severely persecuted uh, by the mainland Chinese government. Okay, so Confucius Institutes, there are, uh, I guess as of about a year ago, there were 465 of them worldwide, of which I know of already a couple that have been discontinued by their universities because of some of those problems. Uh, set up in a kind of a complementary fashion to those were Confucius classrooms, which were to teach Chinese language at the K-12 level. And uh, those have probably been a little more successful because many school districts are strapped for money. And so if the Chinese government wants to pay to have classes in Chinese, well, isn't that great? Well, again, if you look around to see some of the reactions, there have been some concerns expressed that it might be indoctrinating American children and other children around the world with a certain, again, prescribed view of China, its heritage, its history in the form of language teaching. Now, some that you may not have heard of, there is a Confucius Literary Prize. And that was set up with funding from China, but is awarded through UNESCO every year. And it usually goes to two or sometimes three groups that are working to promote literacy among poor or disadvantaged groups in countries everywhere around the world. And uh, a large number of those countries turn out to be in Africa. Isn't that interesting? Well. Probably a good thing to work on literacy there, but you also have to wonder, is there any connection with China's hunt for resources? <laughs> who knows? But again, as I say, it is awarded by UNESCO, so who knows if China has a lot of influence over that. There's a Confucius Cultural Prize, which was started by the Shandong Provincial Government, again, the province where the hometown of Confucius uh, is located. And that is uh, jointly sponsored by the National Ministry of Culture. Now that's kind of more orthodox in a way. It goes to people who have promoted the study of Confucius and Confucianism around the world. And starting in, in 2009, uh, the first award went to Du Wei Ming, who China scholars in the room will know as a very eminent uh, professor of Chinese uh, thought and uh, intellectual history. 
There's even a Confucius Peace Prize. And that was started in 2010 when the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to Liu Xiaobo, <laughs> who is a dissident writer and was not allowed to leave uh, imprisonment or house arrest in China to actually go accept his Nobel. And the idea was that it would promote a Chinese view of peace. And it was started by some private funds, but it was taken over uh, by the uh, Ministry of Culture. Uh, in 2011, it was awarded to Vladimir Putin. Isn't that an interesting <laughs> definition of peace? Now, and as many of you may remember, President Hu Jintao opened the 2008 Summer Olympics in Beijing by quoting Confucius. Isn't it a delight to have friends come from afar? That is in the first uh, verse of the Analects, or the sayings of Confucius. And there were some events in that opening ceremony that evoked the idea of uh, people in pseudo-traditional costumes holding ancient uh, rolls of bamboo strips, which were the form of books uh, in Confucius's day, and dancing in a very ceremonious manner. Uh, so this is just one uh, such scene. Uh, the teachings of Confucius are being much published and discussed in books and television programs and films and animated cartoons. And I will be showing a little more about some of these forms uh, in later time. And again, people who are a little more tuned into the scene in China will recognize the name of this uh, author, Yu Dan, who is actually a woman uh, at uh, a university in Beijing who's a professor of communications. But she wrote a kind of popularized book on the Analects, or the sayings of Confucius, that is often characterized in foreign media as being chicken soup for the Confucian soul. <laughs> so anyhow, a lot of things have been uh, going on in very recent years to spread uh, awareness and hopefully uh, respect and imitation of uh, Confucius. Uh, Chinese children are now learning to recite the foundational Confucian texts, such as the Analects. And uh, I should say that it, the Analects is a collection of conversations, some of them with Confucius, some of them with his disciples and their disciples. It's kind of a grab bag of uh, different little episodes and epigrams. But it is a very engaging way to become familiar with uh, some of the core ideas of uh, Confucianism. So it is a fairly straightforward thing to memorize it, and that was done uh, throughout the imperial period, and now that practice is beginning to come back. And there has been a lot of grassroots interest, not only a government top-down initiative, but also people think that this is a good thing for character development, uh, moral cultivation, and you know, good family values kind of thing. Uh, so we see the children uh, actually dressed up in, again, sort of pseudo-traditional costume. Uh, chanting uh, from their books. They're supposed to memorize it eventually. Now, initially it seemed that uh, Hu Jintao's successor, Xi Jinping, might not continue with so many high-level efforts to promote Confucianism, but he has heartily endorsed them since coming to power in late 2012. Uh, one thing he did in uh, 2013, November of 2013, was he made a pilgrimage to Chufu, the home of Confucius in Shandong province, and he toured all the sites, the temple, the mansion, the graveyard, and uh, even went to the Confucius Research Institute and browsed through some of the books, as we see him doing on the right. Uh, in 2014, he delivered the keynote address to the uh, fifth international meeting of the Confucius Association, which took place in the Great Hall of the People, which is a major uh, site of governmental and uh, diplomatic uh, activities in Beijing. And at this speech, this address that he made, he called for the preservation and development of China's traditional cultural heritage in order to make the past serve the present. But of course, it has to be on terms acceptable to the Communist Party. So what do they emphasize? It's uh, things like hierarchy and discipline and order, morality. Um, elsewhere, not at this particular speech, but not so long ago, he actually said, the Confucian classics should become ingrained in students' minds and become the genes, G-E-N-E-S, of Chinese culture. So that is uh, the current situation with uh, Xi Jinping. 
Um, he even made the statement that people in this room who are old enough to remember events of the Maoist period would find rather surprising. He said, from the day it was founded, the Chinese Communist Party has been a loyal standard bearer and proponent of the excellent elements of traditional Chinese culture and have integrated them with Marxist principles. Whoa. <laughs> So anyone who can remember the Cultural Revolution, and I see a few of you in the room, and I'm one of them, let me say, the Cultural Revolution took place from 1966 to 76. It is mind-boggling to see the transformation of Confucius from the arch-villain of feudalism to China's great thinker, educator, and statesman. That is the phrase you always hear. And it's, you know, it's like a, an incantation. And most contemporary discussions of Confucius or Confucianism simply skip over the Cultural Revolution period. They don't even acknowledge that it ever happened. And I dare say that a lot of young people in China today are pretty much unaware of that period of history. And visually, uh, there used to be statues, gigantic statues of Chairman Mao all over China in universities and public squares and all that sort of thing. Well, they've mostly disappeared. And instead, we have lots of monumental statues of Confucius. Uh, they often stand at restored temples, uh, Confucian temples that uh, were built all around China in the imperial period, but were smashed or put to other uses during the earlier part of the 20th century. And some of them appear at schools or libraries, uh, museums, cultural sites of various types. Now the largest of those that I've come across so far, and this is a topic that every time I look on the internet, I find something else that really blows me away. And this is my one most recent uh, amazing uh, find on the internet. Uh, this is, as far as I know, the largest statue of Confucius to date. It's being built at the alleged site of his birth, just outside of Chufu in Shandong province. There is a beautiful mountain area called Nishan. And it's supposedly where he was, where his mother prayed for a son and where he was born in a cave. And you know, you can believe that or not. But in any case, this is where this gigantic statue that counting its base together with the statue is almost 300 feet. That is a football field's length or height. And I find that really quite extraordinary. And it's not the only thing that's going to be at this new uh, Nishan Holy Land, as it is called. Uh, there'll also be um, kind of a theme park environment with a museum and educational facilities, a convention center, uh, you know, children's activities, and an old-timey folk village so that you can imagine what it was like when Confucius was a child growing up in ancient China. Uh, this is being uh, completed, I think it's supposed to be finished by the end of the year, and uh, these photos, uh, the one on the right, I think was August, yeah, my slide says August 2015, and uh, so far they've spent 17.6 billion renminbi, which is about 2.8 billion U.S. dollars. And this is being uh, very <coughs> strongly backed by, the again, the Shandong Provincial uh, cultural tourism authorities and some uh, uh, Ministry of Culture uh, funding as well. Now all of this is being presented to the populace as oh, just kind of uh, getting back in touch with Chinese tradition. But there are many ways in which these developments uh, represent a departure rather than a return to uh, ways of the past. And I'm not speaking only of its relationship to the Cultural Revolution. For one thing, the profusion of public imagery is a modern development. Uh, visual, uh, visual representations of Confucius familiarize the populace with him, but until the late 19th century, ordinary Chinese would not have seen any images of Confucius, nor would they have been expected to deeply engage with his teachings. This was something that was very much monopolized by the extremely well-educated upper segment of male society, so-called literati, 
who also provided uh, the government official loan. Uh, so during the imperial period, there were state-sponsored rituals for worshiping Confucius, at which animals were sacrificed and chants and music and dance and so forth uh, performed, offerings made in uh, various uh, manners. And these were conducted only by these educated people. You had to have passed at least the first level of civil service exam to be part of this uh, experience. And it was all highly uh, controlled and uh, prescribed with a ritual code and exactly what you wore, what you offered, what sort of order you did it in. And uh, this also spread to areas beyond China that were influenced by Chinese uh, traditions and culture, and that would include uh, Korea as well as Japan. Uh, my slide down in the lower right there shows uh, the enactment of such a ceremony even after the imperial period uh, in the temple in Taipei. During the late imperial period, Taipei was just the smallest and most insignificant uh, outpost of China, and so its temple was actually not a very grand one. In contrast to the one that left, which was the temple in the capital of Beijing, where the emperor, if he chose to offer the sacrifice in person, rather than having an official do it, or if he went there to hear a lecture by a descendant or scholar of Confucianism. This grand temple was where he would go. Now these temples did not have images after 1530. Before that time there were some, uh, often they were sculptural or they could be painted, but in 1530 the emperor at the time decided that it was too distracting from the true essence of uh, Confucius, and he was truly a teacher and should not be worshipped like a, a god with these uh, figures that were so similar to those in Buddhist temples and Taoist temples and that ordinary people would go to and you know, ask for benefits for their own uh, personal life. Um, the only temple, uh, this is a, sorry, the inter interior view of this uh, imperial temple in Beijing that shows that Confucius and all of his disciples and other followers were worshipped there were simply represented by tablets inscribed with their names and uh, honorary titles. So we see in the uh, little detail here, this just says uh, the Confucius, the supreme sage and first teacher spirit tablet. And so there were no you know, figural images at all in these temples. And there were temples, uh, as I say, extending all the way to the borders of empire, like in Taipei. They had them in all the administrative centers, and people were expected to make these uh, offerings at least twice a year, according to the prescribed liturgy. But no images, except the temple in his hometown, Chufu. Why was that allowed to have images? And the images uh, were those that you know, reflected the titles he was given after his death that were ever increasingly high up to the point of being uh, regal titles. So he's dressed here. Uh, this is a, a photo that was taken in the 1940s so when it was still the sculptural uh, image that was from 1730. It was built by uh, the Qing Emperor's uh, palace uh, artisans. It was a very high level production, but it was smashed by the Cultural Revolution Red Guards, as you saw in my previous slide. And uh, this is a color photograph that was taken actually in 1913 by a French uh, visitor. So it was a very grand imperial kind of thing, and this is what the emperor in 1530 wanted to get away from. So he, Confucius was not a king in his lifetime. He was just uh, pretty much a failed statesman. He went around to the ancient uh, courts and tried to offer his services as an advisor and most of the time they you know, had him for a while and they figured he was not very useful and he kind of had to move on. And he spent the last years of his life teaching and transmitting ancient texts and you know, so he was not a successful political figure and so this was very unrepresentative. But the descendants of Confucius who have continued to live in the Chufu area as well as moving around to other parts of China have maintained a cult of ancestor worship. And so because that temple served both the official function and the ancestral function, they were allowed to keep these grand, imperial looking representations. And I think you can see the details a little better in uh, an illustration that was published with the temple's, uh, we call it a gazetteer, it's kind of a history 
and uh, accounting of all of the features of the temple and the uh, tablets of inscriptions and so forth. But we can see in the uh, details of his costume, there are these uh, symbolic emblems that uh, stand for things having to do with the heavens and with uh, emperors and so forth, and then the crown. That's probably the most uh, obvious uh, sign of his high status in posthumous titles. These are titles awarded long after his death by various emperors who were trying to gain the allegiance of the educated class by showing respect to Confucius. Now there were other kinds of images that educated men also saw in some numbers, uh, more informal ones that would circulate. They were not temple images, but they might be found in schools, academies. There were schools attached to most of the, the official temples. And they uh, might sometimes have uh, stone tablets set in the wall with uh, pictures of Confucius and often his favorite disciple, who's shown in the slide at the left. Oh, I see I have a little typo there. His name is Yen Hui. And the stone is dated 1563. And these are rubbings that were made from the stone. That, that was a way of replicating the design and making lots of copies of it. And you could then circulate them and carry them to other places. So this kind of imagery was spread very readily by that uh, means. And uh, they are often given uh, titles, such as on the middle. This one is, I translate, uh, Shanshan Yi Xiang as the legacy portrait or the left behind portrait of the exalted sage. And on the far right, a uh, portrait of Confucius, the first teacher circulating the teachings. I keep changing my translation for this Xing Jia. And if anybody has uh, some ideas about what the true meaning of Xing Jia means, I used to think it was traveling and teaching. And then I thought it was practicing the teaching. And now I'm thinking it's circulating the teachings. Anyway, so an image of Confucius in his older age, when he had given up his ambitions to be a statesman and with a job at a feudal court and then devoted to teaching. Uh, the features of these uh, images, uh, they pretty much always include a sword, uh, whether you can see much of it uh, here, it's sticking out the other way. Uh, either a simple headdress or just a cloth cap. Uh, often a heavy beard and eyebrows, but there was actually controversy as to whether he even had facial hair. There was someone who started a story in the 14th century. Actually, Confucius didn't have any facial hair, so then there was a you know, <laughs> among other things. So some of them have more hair, and this one has, I would say, less. And um, whether the figure looks kind of homely and awkward and know, kind of, you feel a little sorry for him, or a little more assertive and vigorous, and someone who's standing up proud. So again, those would be seen by the educated male elite, if anyone, not by the ordinary populace. Now in addition to just simple portraits, there were also, um, from the mid-15th century, sets of pictures of the life of Confucius, and annotated uh, usually with the uh, passages from the earliest history of, of China, the Shiji, in which there was a very lengthy biography. And uh, the author of the Shiji admired Confucius very much and uh, wrote a very long biography. And then he even went to Chufu to pay homage to him at the end, or near the end of his uh, career, and wrote about how incredibly moving an event that was for him. In any case, these pictorial biographies were made in various different media and including painting, and here I decided to just use the same event and show three different uh, forms of it. A painting in ink and color on silk, which is part of a, a very large album, and you can hardly see, but the accompanying text is written directly on the painting here. Sometimes it might be written at the side, so not in the picture. Uh, they were sometimes incised on tablets, and then again, you can make these rubbings and have sets uh, to circulate. And uh, finally, woodblock printing uh, made a big uh, impact on the ability for these things to circulate. So there are woodblock printed portfolios, I think is the right word, because they were large. Or if you wanted a cheap version, it would be small and more like a little book. But in any case, what we have going on here is the mother of Confucius standing at a high table with an incense burner. And she is praying to the god of Nishan, this mountain, for a son. 
And so that's what we see in uh, pretty much the same basic composition with a few details changed in the background. Uh, these pictorial biographies could be anything from, oh, about 30 episodes illustrated to the biggest one uh, that has any uh, impact on later events is 112 scenes. I actually didn't bring any pictures of that, but so it could be kind of a flexible subject, but it seems to have been of interest at best only, again, to this educated male elite. And even they weren't that interested in seeing pictures of the life of Confucius because most people agreed that his importance was as the transmitter of the way, and his teachings, his words, his classics were much more important than anything about his flesh and blood life. Uh, so even uh, these were not particularly uh, well known. Now, the situation changed at the end of the dynastic period. Uh, in, the, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, so the period when China was rapidly modernizing, uh, some of the influential reformers wanted to just chuck Confucianism all together as uh, an impediment to modernization. But others thought that it might be a cultural resource and that China could modernize itself but using traditional uh, means as part of its new national identity. And the uh, one group that very strongly advocated this position uh, was called the uh, Society for the Preservation of National Learning, the Gorsrea Bautzen Hui. And in their first journal issue, on the left, you see a kind of frontispiece portrait of Confucius. It's kind of similar to those ones that I've shown before, except that there are some Western techniques used in drawing and shading and a little bit of perspective to give him a little more substantive quality, you know, a little more three-dimensionality. Uh, whereas in uh, the next uh, year's issue, they opened it with a picture that was just copied from that rubbing we saw a moment ago from uh, 1563. And that kind of, uh, I think, symbolizes the idea of really using China's own cultural resources for modernizing, not uh, depending on Western techniques. Uh, there were even attempts to uh, create a national religion of Confucianism. And the group associated with that, uh, I think the name Kanye Wei is probably best known, but a group known as the Confucius Religion Association, the Kung Jiao Wei, was founded by uh, Kanye Wei's follower, uh, Chen Huang Zhang. And they very openly used the analogy of Jesus and Christianity to have Confucius, the founder of Confucianism, and the year is counted as, you know, the Kung Li, the Confucius calendar from the date of his birth, you know, the way we count years uh, A.D. And the uh, opening illustration of their journal visualizes the Temple of Confucius, not with tablets, but with uh, anthropomorphic representations. Confucius as kind of a God the Father figure seated on a throne in the middle of all his disciples and later followers. There were also some attempts to get the general populace at this point to worship Confucius. And I haven't really found anyone who writes about this, but I suspect that this Confucius Religion Association had something to do with that. There was an existing tradition of creating kind of popular woodblock prints of gods who could help you with your daily life concerns or to protect your household. And Confucius was kind of slotted into this iconography. So we see, uh, this uh, very striking uh, treatment of Confucius in the center of uh, four figures that look like just uh, attendants, but in fact their name uh, labels that we see here identify them as the so-called uh, four correlates, the most important disciples of Confucius who had positions of honor in the temple. And then uh, things that are very common to the uh, votive print uh, arena are things like these bright red colors on the faces and outsized uh, proportions of the significant parts. But to emphasize uh, Confucius' association with learning, we see piles of books as well as uh, other scholarly accoutrements on his table. And you notice that he is being represented in this emperor guise. Now I think that came uh, pretty directly from those uh, illustrations in the Temple Gazetteer, which there were several editions and 
a lot of copies floating around. To, even today, you can find uh, this without too much difficulty. So I think this was probably the basis for creating these the more popular images. Uh, there's a lot of similarity between these two, I think. But uh, maybe more importantly, this influence from the popular tradition of other gods, like the stove god or the ox king or the dragon king. This one is of the dragon king over here. And again, I would say, you know, the outside spaces, the temple environment shown behind them, and four major attendants, and so forth, uh, suggest that connection. Uh, it's not clear that this attempt to popularize the worship of Confucius really caught on so strongly among ordinary folks at this time, again, the sort of early 20th century. Now, there may have been a little more uh, governmental impetus behind that effort uh, in the 1930s uh, with the nationalist government promoting the New Life Movement. And they had a kind of a definite policy of going back to Confucius as part of the national identity. And they published uh, this particular edition of the pictorial biography uh, in quite a lot of uh, copies of the society that uh, is officially listed as publishing it actually had a, a name that suggested it was a nationalistic um, or even nativist group, uh, Beiping Nation Society, and Beiping is the same place as Beijing, it wasn't the capital at the time. Uh, so a lot of copies uh, produced of this, and these two scenes show uh, Confucius sitting with disciples, very orderly and disciplined and hierarchical and respectful and so forth, so you know, great role model for the uh, Public. And then over here, this is kind of a curious scene where Confucius has finished editing his classics and is offering them to the Northern Dipper, who is uh, associated with uh, ruling and so forth. So the Dipper over here is sending down a rainbow, according to the text, uh, which turns into a piece of yellow jade on the altar. So it's kind of a supernatural element, but a sign of heavenly approval of his life work. Now there's also a film made in 1940. After the Japanese invasion of Shanghai, there was a, still a kind of an enclave of the international settlement that wasn't controlled by the Japanese uh, immediately, and a filmmaker named Fei Mu uh, made a film about the last 25 years of the life of Confucius when he was traveling around and, and teaching. And um, it was very uh, expensive production. It was recently rediscovered and restored at great expense and effort and shown at the Hong Kong uh, Film Festival a couple of years ago. In any case, in this movie, Confucius speaks in classical Chinese, very slow and stately, and everything is beautifully composed and kind of picturesque. And uh, it creates the impression of uh, Chinese civilization uh, at its best, but also in a sense under stress. So the larger situation of the Japanese invasion was very much part of its uh, effect. It was also portrayed on stamps and banknotes, not only by the nationalist government, but by the regime set up by the Japanese in Manchuria, the so-called Manzhou War, Manchu Guo, I don't know how we say it in English even, but the regime that the Japanese established uh, and had a puppet emperor, uh, kind of a titular head, and you know, put Confucius on some of their money. Uh, as far as I know, Confucius has not been used on money since the 40s, but there have been rumors on occasion that if they ever create a 500 renminbi banknote in mainland China, Maybe they would put him, I mean, Chairman Mao was on all the other money, so it would be kind of odd. <laughs> but, and then two, Confucius is supposedly someone who said that only the small man cares about profit. So you know, not associating him with money is probably the way to go. Now, initially after the 1949 revolution, uh, Confucius was downplayed as just sort of part of the feudal past and kind of a museum relic. But during the Cultural Revolution, as we saw, his legacy and physical representations were violently attacked. Many of the temples were damaged or destroyed. And here we see, again, the statue with these very unflattering 
slogans. This is something like number one bad egg, and that is one of the nastiest things you can call someone in Chinese. And over here, uh, after they sort of punched a hole in the stomach, they dragged the statue out of the temple and destroyed it. And here they actually uh, were digging up the grave of Confucius, intending to give him a thrashing. Well, they didn't find him in it, <laughs> so who knows why. But in any case, that was how vehement things were in November of 1966. And then in 1974, there was kind of a revival of the anti-Confucius uh, campaign, but connected with the downfall of Lin Biao. And it is thought that attacking Lin Biao and Confucius together really was using Confucius as a stand-in for Zhou Enlai, who, again, those of you old enough to remember the name will remember that he was someone who actually wanted to protect China's cultural heritage and uh, prevented the temple at Chufu from being totally destroyed. In any case, um, that period spawned a lot of uh, popular little uh, picture books, and these were a couple that I was able to find without any difficulty. And they're both titled variations on something like The Evil Life of Kung Lao Ar, the second son named Kung. And he had an older brother, so that's why they call him Second Son. And they take the episodes from the pictorial biography that had been circulating for so many centuries by this point and just kind of reinterpret the event. So instead of Confucius saying, I'm, you know, if, if, when someone was threatening to kill him, you know, he felt that he was protected by heaven, um, they show him just cowering under the tree as if, you know, oh, please don't hurt me, you know, just uh, very uh, unsympathetic. Now, during those same years of the Cultural Revolution, there was a cultural renaissance going on in uh, Taiwan, and I think very explicitly in reaction, uh, the nationalist government retreated to Taiwan after 1949, the end of the Chinese Civil War, which the nationalists lost. And at first, they didn't do so much with Confucius, but by the uh, early 70s, they were promoting him again and decided to make an official portrait of Confucius to use as the basis for large statues. And there are quite a few of these statues around, and the one that I'm showing here is actually at the National Palace Museum in Taiwan. Uh, but you can find them uh, even abroad. There, I, I was particularly surprised to find one in uh, Cleveland, not so far from the Cleveland Museum a few years ago. But in any case, they used the rubbing that I showed there on the left as the basis for these statues. So showing Confucius as a elderly man, a little stooped over, hands together in this uh, kind of respectful gesture and with a very benevolent uh, look on his face. Oh, I should mention too that uh, the reason why they chose this particular uh, image was because the senior descendant in the 77th generation after Confucius, who was a titled member of Chinese society. He had the first, he was the title, his title was that of a duke. But in 1935, uh, Chiang Kai-shek changed it to just the uh, sacrificing official for Confucius. In any case, he was the leader of the whole lineage of uh, Kung descendants and in charge of veneration rituals. And he fled to Taiwan with the nationalists. He knew that the communists were going to get rid of him pretty quick if he stayed behind. So he was very closely involved with selecting this image as the basis for these statues. And it was because as a child, he had remembered seeing it in Chufu. He was born in 1920 and had uh, grown up in his early years there, but had had to leave during the Japanese invasion. So he'd only been in Chufu probably for about 15 years or so. And so this was his sort of childhood memory of what Confucius looked like. Now, once the Cultural Revolution on the mainland ended in 1976, Chairman Mao died, and very quickly the people who had been advocating <coughs> all this destruction of past culture fell from power, and a process under, got underway to rehabilitate Confucius and some aspects of traditional Chinese culture. Um, so this was uh, going on by the early 1980s. They began uh, first, I think, in about 1984, the China Confucius Foundation was set up with government funding and backing. And some of these temples around China that had been either wrecked or at least turned into other kinds of uh, 
uses, so it began to be restored and made to nice for tourism, and large statues started appearing in front of many of them, or in some cases, uh, pictures of Confucius inside over the altars. Now, uh, I could probably spend the next 12 hours showing pictures of all these examples that I found, but I'll just leave it uh, with these two to represent the kind of thing I'm talking about. Now, some of the early uh, examples of sculpture were sent by the Confucius Academy of Hong Kong, which was the successor to the Confucius Religion Association. And uh, they all bear these little inscriptions that identify that as uh, the donor. And so it seems like this was kind of uh, the, the Confucius uh, religion people seeing their chance to have another go at it. But setting up those big images seems to have attracted behaviors that people were accustomed to performing in front of other images, such as Buddhas and Taoist gods and popular cult gods and so forth. So all of a sudden, even though ordinary people had never been involved with worshiping Confucius, we find them burning incense, bowing, hanging votive placards, you know, asking for success on the exams, and particularly because Confucius is associated with literacy and education, around the time of the university entrance exams, there is a flood of new placards hanging off the fences around many of these statues. And uh, over in the lower right there, this is a group of um, 72 life-size ceramic sculptures of the disciples of Confucius, and they're set up uh, on the grounds of the former imperial temple in Beijing, and people have also used them as the focus for their devotions and requests. Uh, they don't limit their requests to uh, success in exams or ability to gain an education. Uh, we find the full range of things that people would ask for at other kinds of temples. You know, long life, good health, lots of sons, wealth. Uh, so he's just become kind of part of the sort of more general uh, popular religious landscape. Uh, well, in uh, early 2006, this China Confucius Foundation, this government established and funded organization, decided that it was a problem that there were so many, just sort of every kind of image of Confucius floating around out there, and they wanted to create a standard portrait. Well, what did they do but choose the very same rubbing that back in Taiwan in 1974 had been taken as the uh, basis. But the one difference was they said the clothing of that image was that of a much later period. So to make it truly the right portrayal, they had to use uh, evidence from archaeological excavation. So the working model is shown like so in the final version, which was unveiled in connection with his birthday in uh, 2006, September 28th, um, is like this. And you might notice he no longer has a sword. Um, they. Uh, particularly told the designers who were involved in creating this to use the description of Confucius that was contained in the Analects, an observation by one of his disciples probably that said he was genial yet strict, imposing yet not intimidating, courteous and yet at ease. And then also they wanted something between ages sort of 60 to 70, so this is what they came up with. Uh, to mark the 2,557th birthday, they made it uh, 2.557 meters in height. So all this kind of numerology stuff. Uh, they subsequently, the foundation had small versions made and medium size, and they put them here and there and everywhere. But um, for the most part, they don't seem to have kind of caught on with the larger public. Uh, they also did things like republish some of the earlier pictorial biographies, and this is the same pair of scenes that I showed from the 1934 edition, but reissued in 1988. And then hit upon the idea of using more modern media to you know, reach the younger generation. So with a lot of money, I uh, don't think I've made a note of exactly how much, so uh, starting in uh, 2009, they broadcast 104 episodes. Now, I might say the number 104 is significant 
because that was how many were in this uh, version of the life of Confucius that I showed here just a moment ago. But they were just completely different, although some of them had a little basis in his recorded biography. So they start with Confucius as a young boy, and they follow him all the way uh, into maturity. So uh, the, they're divided into four seasons, and at each one, he's sort of a different age. So at the upper left, he's a child of about 10, and then he's an adolescent, and a young man, and then a mature man. Uh, each of the episodes is about uh, 12 or so minutes long. They all start with children's voices chanting the first line of the Analects, which is uh, to learn something and then put it into practice at the right time. Is it not a pleasure? So you kind of hear this as the pictures are uh, scrolling. And then I'll show just some scenes from the first episode. Uh, Isn't You can find these online if you want to see them uh, as actual moving pictures. So he's shown, uh, he's introduced as this young boy and his mother's widowed. His mother was many decades younger than his father. Probably he was an illegitimate child, but never mind. And he was a lonely kid. <laughs> who, for whatever reason, was fascinated with temple rituals. He lived in a, in a place where the descendants of the previous dynasty were uh, given offerings. And so he was interested in watching and imitating those rituals. So we see him with his little pal uh, with a set of ritual vessels down in the lower right. And then uh, there's this whole thing about how he falls asleep and dreams that he's fallen into a meadow with flowers, and he goes down, 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 and then he sees this orchid, fairly visible, right here. And as he watches, it turns into a <laughs> big sister orchid, like a fairy godmother. She reappears in every episode. And in this first episode, he's lamenting that, you know, he's so poor and his mother's poor and he's just, he has no prospects. And she tells him, you know, you can, you can make something of yourself. And he says, you know, ah, I can't. <laughs> and then she says, you know, the secret is study. And so it's like, <laughs> the light bulb goes off. And he wakes up, he runs to the mountain, supposedly where he was born. And the very end of the episode, he's standing there looking out over this landscape as these white birds flutter up. He's saying, I want to study! <laughs> so it's, it's very entertaining. It's got, uh, you know, the first couple of episodes so pretty much stick close to, you know, things that are known about his early life, but they get more and more creative as he grows older and less relatable to young kids. So in the later episodes, when he's a grown man, there's a lot more emphasis on this kind of piglet sidekick. <laughs> <laughs> and he's always getting into scrapes and having to call on Big Sister Orchid for help. And yeah, it's, you know, it's very entertaining. <laughs> At the end of uh, every episode, there's a little bit of a didactic message, you know, to make it not just pure entertainment, but to be a little bit uh, educational and and so forth. Uh, they were produced at very high quality uh, production facilities, and in fact, uh, the series apparently won uh, a big award at the Cannes, uh, what is it, the, I forget, MPV uh, Festival in 2011. So, you know, they put a lot of money into it, and they got a lot of uh, recognition for it, and it made a lot of tie in products. Uh, Backpack, for example, with a quote, uh, you know, if you're virtuous, then you'll have a lot of company. And uh, the idea is to not only educate Chinese children, but children of the world. So they've been translated. They're actually, I think, are going to be uh, audio versions as well in other languages. But in any case, you can not only buy books, you can get e-books, you can get DVDs. And I just found this page on Amazon. And so this is just the ad for the first episode. They go all the way through. And if you click on where it says read more, right in the middle, uh, I found this really extraordinary. It says, if you or your ancestors were Chinese, no matter where you are, you are bound to have the genes of Confucianism. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and if you are a foreign friend, like some of us here, Understanding Confucius is the best way to learn about China and Chinese culture. So, you know, this again is part of that soft power push. 
Uh, now for older people, in 2010, actually it was supposed to be released in 2009, but a major motion picture starring the action hero uh, Chang Yun Fat as Confucius. Now I must mention, Chang Yun Fat is from Hong Kong, and he speaks Cantonese. Yeah, he knows Mandarin, but he speaks it with a sort of Cantonese accent, and playing Confucius was a real stretch for him. <laughs> he took it very seriously. I think he really did quite a good job considering all that. He even made a visit to the um, most senior member of the Confucian uh, lineage, an elderly woman, and there's a picture on the internet of him doing this kowtow thing in front of her. I mean, it's truly made. He took it seriously. But this film, unlike the 1941, shows Confucius as a man of action. You know, he can shoot archery, he can lead troops, he does this and that. And again, it follows him just for the last sort of 25 years of his life. So, you know, he advises um, rulers and um, travels among the states and talks with his disciples, conducts rituals, advises a summit meeting, and the cinematography is really quite breathtaking. Uh, the same guy that did uh, Red Cliff and some of the other blockbusters, uh, John Woo, was in charge of them. And some battle scenes, you know, cast of thousands kind of stuff. But really the most striking part from my uh, perspective was the emphasis they placed on his apparently very brief encounter with this dissolute woman who was the wife of the Duke of Dukeling of Wei. And according to his recorded biography, he only met with her because he was trying to get a job in the Duke of Wei's state. But the movie suggests there might have been a little more going on. So I'll just show you these pictures. <laughs> so here she is, and she makes her entrance with this very seductive look. And as it says in the translation, Confucius, will you stay in our kingdom? And can we meet again? <laughs> China than any movie before it, kicking off the 2D version of Avatar. And people were kind of angry about that. And moreover, it was generally not received terribly well. I think a lot of the critics thought it was kind of boring, despite all of this, you know, razzmatazz and cinematography and so forth. So there were quite a few cartoons characterizing, caricaturing uh, the movie. So I guess the, the point there is that you know, the, the best intentions can sometimes be thwarted by the will of the people, who knows? Now, uh, just a few of the other um, sometimes authorized, sometimes not appropriations of Confucius. I thought this was really a very interesting little episode, but it probably wasn't um, fully approved in advance. I'm referring to the pictures on the left, where Confucius pictures were used on lottery tickets, along with quotations from the analects. And apparently you would win if, I don't know, somehow you drew something that matched the ticket. I don't know what exactly. But uh, this was only done in Chufu, and it seems to have been a very local initiative to raise money. And you can't find much about it on the internet, so I have a feeling that you know, the authorities clamped down and said this is inappropriate. You know, Confucius was not concerned with profit. On the other hand, the descendants are very much into exploiting his name and reputation for all kinds of products. Uh, so there's you know, Confucius liquor, um, Confucius beer, Confucius every kind of, you know. And this particular ad I thought was interesting because you can get your liquor in a bottle that's shaped like a statue of Confucius. You know, it comes in this nice box. Anyway. Uh, in 2011, all of a sudden, literally overnight, a gigantic statue of Confucius appeared at the edge of Tiananmen Square in Beijing, right outside the newly reopened National Museum of China. It was newly, not only renovated building, but renamed. It had been the Museum of Chinese History, but it was now the National Museum of China. And this statue was not quite the same kind of image as the standard portrait or the earlier ones based on that uh, rubbing, but rather were kind of more, um, I don't know, the person who was responsible for designing it was a, a noted sculptor who taught at the uh, Central Academy of Art, and so it was kind of a more you know, artsy thing. But putting it up in close proximity to Tiananmen Square, 
where you have, uh, looking north, you see the gigantic portrait of Chairman Mao, and that's the palace there, so that's very symbolic. Uh, looking across the way, you see the Great Hall of the People, the monument to the revolutionary martyrs down in the south end of the square, the main uh, structure right here. That's the uh, Chairman Mao Memorial Hall, where you can see his embalmed body if you stand in line one of three mornings a week and divest yourself of purses, cameras, anything ex extraneous, except you can take flowers in there. And inside, too, you can see this uh, seated uh, statue of Mao. So this is a very symbolic and hallowed ground for the history of the Chinese Communist Revolution. And so to have Confucius, that obviously caused problems because all of a sudden he was removed from that place outside next to the square into a kind of minor spot inside uh, the entranceway to this National Museum, really off where you would not particularly look. You know, there's sort of greenery and other parts of the building are visible. And uh, you have to really look to find him. And at best, you know, people use them for backdrops of uh, photos. Uh, there was no discussion of why this happened, or at least no really credible discussion, because apparently the Chinese uh, Communist authorities forbade news organizations from inquiring closely into what was going on here. So, you know, the statue literally disappeared overnight and then reemerged inside this. Uh, courtyard inside the museum. And it's not an inappropriate place. You know, if Confucius is identified as the essence of Chinese cultural history, well, this National Museum is kind of associated with that. 5,000 years of history, China's achievements in culture, and so forth. Uh, but more likely, it had something to do with this power struggle among the party elite, you know, the sort of more lefty, red Maoist types uh, just really objecting to having Confucius there confronting Chairman Mao. Uh, but that statue did catch on in other places. So um, another site associated with descendants of Confucius, tracing back to when they had to flee from Chufu in the 1120s to the south, uh, the descendants, a group of descendants have stayed there, and they have what is called the Temple of the Southern Kungs. Well, maybe they're just uh, a little more independent-minded, but they have put up this version of the same statue in a public park, and it's treated very nicely and you know, everything very appropriate. And there are even a few other examples. I think there's one in Nanjing, and I, I can't remember where all else. Now, in that same year of 2011, when the statue business started getting going, we have a major contemporary artist doing a show called Q Confucius. And in Chinese, it looks like he's saying, you know, inquire of Confucius or ask Confucius. And you might recognize at least the body part of that uh, rubbing again with this, you know, question Confucius and characters there. Uh, so he had a series of installations, the most uh, widely commented and reproduced of which was called Confucius Number no. Two. And it showed Confucius as this, you know, kind of pathetic old man, all slump shouldered and greasy hair and uh, sitting in a pool of water. And it was clearly based on one of the approved portraits that the uh, communist authorities have really uh, reproduced a lot of different places. This one that's called uh, Confucius at Leisure. And uh, it, it has a completely different uh, vibe, I would say. Instead of looking like he's at leisure and relaxed, he looks sort of sad and defeated and who knows what. Among the other installations uh, was, I didn't bring a slide of this, but uh, was a cage full of monkeys and a kind of puppet Confucius that would sit up and lie down, sit up and lie down. And meanwhile, the monkeys did whatever monkeys do. So it was um, kind of an enigmatic exhibition, uh, to say the least. And it seemed to me that part of his message was, you know, questioning whether Confucius really was going to be useful in, you know, China's way forward. Now, at the opposite extreme from questioning Confucius, we have a retired PLA army general who has created what is being touted on the internet, at least in English language sources, as Confucius the Redeemer. And this is at the place on the seaside of Beidaipo, where the high Communist Party officials go for their summer holidays. 
Uh, this photo was taken, uh, I think, in the cold season, but nonetheless, it's a place where you know, the party people would see it. And it shows a little different image of Confucius, but it is juxtaposed with a monument to Xi Jinping's idea of the Chinese dream. So uh, it turns out that this army general claims that, oh, no, we didn't have any official you know, go ahead to it, but you've got to be suspicious in any case. So the two are juxtaposed. And uh, unlike uh, the ones that go back to earlier prototypes uh, from uh, Chinese uh, earlier art, I think the inspiration probably was uh, this. I mean, I have not personally been to Rio de Janeiro, but I gather that it truly looms over the city. And um, anyway, the same uh, outstretched arm posture, you know, welcoming all and sundry. Well, um, I thought I would just, you know, I've kind of been having a lot of fun with this talk and the topic in general, but I would just, you know, kind of sober up for a second and just say, well, early depictions of Confucius, the very earliest ones that we know of, are at least 500 years after his death. There is no way, you know, that we could have a, something that actually looks like him. And the earliest examples are uh, ones that show him here bowing to this other figure of, of some venerable age, and he's usually identified as Lao Tzu, who's said to be the founder of Taoism. And there's usually a child playing in between them who's identified with a boy named Xiang Tuo, who is supposedly a boy genius and asked Confucius questions that he couldn't answer. So maybe the idea is, well, Confucius is willing to learn from Lao Tzu, the old boy, and Xiang Tuo, the young boy. So this is the kind of thing that, uh, you know, based in uh, shrines and tombs and so forth. Uh, so uh, I would say, as you saw with the rubbings, uh, the traditional representations were fairly limited in you know, how they represent Confucius, fairly, you know, always very sober, and, proper and usually elderly and so forth. And so these uh, more recent examples have broadened the range way beyond that. And uh, they've been widely circulated to groups that would never have expected to see him. And not just in China, but the whole world. And uh, who knows what will happen next? Well, thank you very much. Questions, I'd be happy Brad, to try to answer. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's been fascinating talking to you. So many afternoons, uh, it's incredible. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about, though, it of course wasn't only 1949 that Confucius started taking flat. Uh, the May 4th era was pretty much a wholesale rejection of Confucianism as an ideology, uh, along with Chinese tradition. Yeah. And it was somewhat in reaction to that that Jiang Kai-shek, in his new life movement, has sort of a, uh, uh, revived Confucius in a more or less authoritarian way, uh, stressing the uh, same ideals you mentioned of uh, obedience, hierarchy, and authority. And this also seemed to set up uh, another dichotomy between the two regimes, whereas the CCP was revolutionary. The nationalists were the uh, preservers and keepers of Chinese tradition. And that was very much stressed after 1949 on Taiwan. Mm -hmm. uh, now, for all the same political, possibly political reasons, we see the regime in China adopting Confucianism. But it also, do you think, could be seen as a possible bridge towards future unification in the sense that we too are preserving our culture. I think definitely. Mm -hmm. um, I guess there have been a couple of books that I've seen recently about you know these people who were more interested in preserving traditional stuff as actually doing that in a way to modernize China according to non-Western standards. So I you know I don't think I've gotten the impression that you know the May Fourth movement, which was so iconoclastic. I mean, they talk about smashing the Confucius family shop, you know, long before the Cultural Revolution. But I think they are not the whole spectrum by a long shot of people that had ideas about you know modernizing China. And I think in the early days, my understanding is that the some of the 
the Kuomintang, the nationalists, uh, weren't particularly interested. They actually took the instruction in the classics out of the classroom for a period, but then they put it back in. And I think maybe for reasons that you know you mentioned, it, it's useful for creating more respect for authority and order and so forth. Um, so yeah, I think um, you know the, the Taiwan Renaissance in the 70s was about showing that you know here in Taiwan we do value traditional Chinese culture and the fact that in the mainland they're now you know from the 80s making the same gestures. I think you know that is intended to be a point of commonality to enable a reunification, <laughs> but whether that will happen.